podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm Chris Stemp. Thanks for joining us again today. We've got a great episode for you today, really highlights that conversation aspect. Instead of an interview, I felt like this was much more conversational, and perhaps that is because I had met our guest previously. It's a really interesting story, and I cover it in the episode. Uh, Also... I just sent out a newsletter a few minutes ago, which not only tells the story, but it kind of tells the lesson that I've learned. And if you haven't signed up for our newsletters, uh, I recommend you do so. We're at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Just head over there. We, we don't send out a ton, but sometimes ideas or thoughts will will strike me after doing hundreds of these interviews that I think are necessary to share. And that's usually the medium in which I'll do that. So if you're interested in some short emails every now and again, highlighting what we've learned, smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter. All right. So this week we are talking with Garrison Wynn. Garrison, he's a really interesting guy, fast talking, Southern accent, you know, Texan, with with just a, a bevy of experiences and he let's see he's worked with some of the world's most effective corporate leaders and business developers he's got a wide varied background but in his teens he worked with magnavox and baseball legend hank aaron to promote the world's first video gaming system and by age 27 he became the youngest department head in a fortune 500 company's history Fast forward to today, he's one of the top motivational speakers in the world, and he is a best-selling author. The two books that we discuss on this show are The Real Truth About Success, What the Top 1% Do Differently, Why They Won't Tell You, and How You Can Do It Anyway, and his most recent book called The Cowbell Principle, Career Advice on How to Get Your Dream Job and Make More Money. So thank you again for tuning in to Smart People Podcast. Make sure you tell the world. That's what we ask of you. If you enjoy this, just get the word out. If you're doing any shopping this holiday season, please use smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. No cost to you. We get a little kickback. Support the show. Really appreciate it. Turning it over now to Garrison Wynn on what the 1% do differently and how do you figure out your most unique value. Enjoy. Well, Garrison, thank you so much for being on the show. Before we do anything, the new format, I just wanted to start off and say, Garrison, tell me a story. I will tell you a story. So a long time ago, I had this boss who wanted me to go recruit. He wanted me to actually go recruit somebody else to work for this company. I was like 30 years old and and so what happened was, is uh, you know, I made some mistakes. I made some first impression uh, mistakes. And the first mistake when I was meeting this person, who was very important, we wanted to you know recruit, was I ordered the lobster. I didn't have like a lot of lobster experience, and I was, you know, trying to eat lobster with this guy. And I, you know, I was kind of like had a lot of tools and butter, and I was kind of confused. I started to kind of shoot lobster shrapnel into the air. It was just really <laughs> embarrassing. It was bad. And after this disturbing dinner, I'm pretty much face to face with this guy. What happened next is gross, but it's important. I'm talking to this guy. And as I'm talking to him, I kind of launched a spit mortar. I'm talking about actually spit up and it had a lot of hang time. I tried to redirect it, but it went directly onto his lip. And, and, and he saw it coming. He actually saw it flying in the air. You know, I saw the horror on his face as it just came right on his lip. Uh, anyway, the next day my boss called, what, you spit in his mouth? I said, no, it was on his lip. That's what happened. Um, with, with no help from me, um, the guy came on board. Uh, and I trained this guy and I made him great, you know. And they asked him like five years later, hey, remember Garrison Wynn, the guy that trained you and made you great? He goes, oh, yeah, the spitter. (laughs) 
So it's like, you know, the, the first impression is the filter with which people view everything you do. And I've never forgotten that, you know, you have to walk into a situation. And the first time you meet somebody, you got to kind of try to try to be okay in that first few minutes. And if you can really help but don't spit in their mouth area. Is all oh, I, ideas. I love that. I love that story. And I actually, so we're going to get into that because I'd like to, to basically hear from you how to make a good first impression. But... Before we do that, I want to tell a quick story that uh, that I didn't prepare you for. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, so for the listeners out there, we met at an airport bar, right? That's correct. And it's really chance meeting is great. It's fantastic. And you know, I, I I we're sitting right next to each other, and I heard you order a water, and you said, "Can I get a water, room temperature water?" And the bartender says, uh, "I don't have any room temperature water. I only have cold water." And you said, "Well." then I'll have to let it sit out for a little bit. And I, I, I caught that out of the corner of my ear because I'm fascinated by people. And I just thought, this guy's got a story. You know, this guy, I got a, this, this guy's got some interesting things to go on. So why, uh, you do a lot of flying, you do a lot of traveling, you do a lot of speaking. Is that part of your thing? You just, you know, the, the, I wanted to know what the water thing was all about. Well, what happens is, is if you drink a lot of cold water, it actually screws up your throat long term. Mm. Matter of fact, uh, I believe opera singers are not allowed to drink cold beverages. It's actually in their contract. It actually downgrades your voice over time. Have you ever been into a, like a, a meeting and seen as somebody who keeps chugging the ice water, but then also talks horribly afterwards? Like they keep <laughs> drinking ice water and they keep clearing their throat. Yeah. It's because the problem is the ice water. So you're drinking water to clear your throat. It's actually doing the opposite. So, yeah, cold beverage is bad for your throat. I I speak for a living, and sometimes I do 12 or 13 events in a single month in 12 different cities. So I've just over the years realized I just can't do it. And and when I was doing stand-up years and years ago, I kind of figured that out a little bit too. I think I'd kind of forgotten it, but I remember – drinking a bunch of cold beverages. Of course, this is a long time ago, and those cold beverages had alcohol in them. But anyway, but, um, <laughs> and I, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I can't really blame it just on the cold. I could have just been drunk, but I yeah. decided that too many beverages, cold beverages before I got up in front of an audience was a good idea. So, Well, I think it's funny because we didn't plan this, but, you know, that was a kind of first impression. And for me, it, it really... I don't know. Like it's, I talked to a lot of people as well. And it just signified somebody who kind of, this might be over analyzing, but knows what they want, you know, has a reason is purposeful. And then I didn't know until we started talking, it's because of your career. So, um, when it comes to these first impressions, what did that, your story, what did that teach you? How do you recommend, or what do you recommend to others in how to create the first impression that they want? Well, first of all, I, I was just thinking about when you talked about the water thing, it's like, well, if that's the first thing you heard me do, I, I, the, I, the first thought you're coming to mind is this person must be from the greater Los Angeles area, which is not, actually, which is not really true. <laughs> I'd like some room temperature water, please. That's funny. Okay. No, but uh, uh, I, I think what this lesson taught me uh, was that, you know, sometimes you have the best intentions. Uh, you actually do the best. You actually conduct yourself really well, you know, overall on paper. But that initial, the initial impression you have, and you know, I've had good uh, and bad with this throughout my life. I've made some very, very good impressions and some very, very bad impressions. And I think you have to manage it. Sometimes I think you have to kind of pause before you walk into a situation and go, okay, I'm meeting this person or I'm in the situation for the very first time. What's, what's most important? What's the most, what is the actual goal of the meeting? Uh, I was talking to a, a group of financial advisors one time. We did, you know, I do conference calls before every, you know, presentation I give. And they always said the, the financial advisors say the goal of a first meeting is to lead to a second meeting. Mm, I love so sometimes that. You, you have to know exactly what your goal is. So I think that's what I've learned from that. So Perfect. Well, and as you alluded to, you do a lot of speaking. And when I went, you know, and, and again, we, we had a very informal conversation when we first right. met. Um, and I just said, this is a smart guy. He's great. I'd love to talk to you, you know. But as I kind of checked out your site, read more about you, I mean, you are the the guy when you think public speaker and, and presenter, really, because it's entertainment, it's messaging, and it's a lot. So let's kind of let's kind of dig into that. How did that come to be? Did you set this as a goal? Because I know a lot of people go, man, if I could get paid to speak, that'd be great. So what was your path to that? Well, it's interesting, and, 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 I, and I've told the story a few times over the years, but every time I tell it, I feel like I've never told it before for some reason. But <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird. So uh, what happened was what my, my goal was, I, I don't know. I didn't really have 
I didn't have goals <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up. I just, you know, but what happened was, is that I, uh, you know, I think I, I, I wanted, I wanted to be in the, the entertainment business. That's really what I thought it was going to be. I thought I would be an actor or a comedian or whatever. And uh, what happened is I, I walked into a comedy club. I mean, literally into a comedy club uh, as a young person. And I walked in and literally did uh, five minutes of stand-up with no experience. And in nine months was earning a living as a professional stand-up comedian. Wow. That's not a common experience. That's not common. So that's just slop luck or whatever. <laughs> that, that's what actually what happened. Um, uh, so I did that and uh, also, you know, had business experiences and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, um, you know, got out of comedy. And that's another story. Uh, but and then into uh, the professional world and ended up uh, I got I had a, a situation where my boss screwed up so badly I got his job. And then I got promoted and I was a 27 year old uh, leader over 38 satellite areas with a big, big company. So I had a, a big job. I, people thought I was my own ad, ad, admin when they met me. They thought I was my own assistant. <laughs> you know, I'm, we're looking for Mr. Wynn. I'm actually him. So I had that kind of scenario go on. So I had the entertainment background. You know, I, uh, I had a, a very fortunate uh, corporate situation. And then at um, age 35 years old, I decided I wasn't going to work in corporate America anymore. And, and it's a kind of a touchy story for some people, but I, I, I got tired of making other people rich. Mm. Which is what I seem to be doing. I'd go somewhere and I would be generating revenue for a company, wasn't getting enough of the money, so I thought. So that's what I did. And uh, so I went out on my own uh, to, to be a, a speaker and I did some corporate comedy stuff, kind of went back into comedy to some degree a little bit, uh, uh, but did actually sketch comedy, did a lot of radio and all that kind of stuff at that point. But eventually I started to just hone my my craft at speaking at conventions and uh, it took a while i mean i spoke at some pretty strange odd weird places you know um i'd i'd, I'd spoke, i mean i really i started off speaking at places where you know it just it didn't it didn't pay much the people there didn't care you know but i was just honing my craft and uh eventually uh over time the audience has got bigger and bigger and now i speak to you know sometimes it could be 3000 people or 4000 people or or 500 people at everywhere it could be associations corporations you name the fortune 100 i've spoken to all those i've been doing this i've been the professional speaker for 20 years so. wow yeah i mean like i said that is when you think of it when you i mean i watched your videos and the, the th one of the things that occurred to me as we talked, one of the things I do is corporate training. So, um, you know, in front of a group and, and teaching things like productivity and presentations. And I have a certain style and it's not yours. It's I, I can't be as I don't know what the word is, but I don't know if exuberant or, you know, and, and so I watch people such as yourself um, a lot of the great speakers, you know, even maybe a Zig Ziglar, as much in some cases performing as it is uh, presenting. And I think I, sometimes I go, man, like I, I can't do this. What do you say to people who maybe in speaking or in other careers look at people who are successful, notice that that's not perhaps their strength? Should they try to utilize their own strengths or should they find a different career? The initial reaction is, well, some people just suck. I mean, there are people out there who just, I mean, they're, they're terrible. They don't, they, but, but, but that is a real small percentage. But I'm going to say something I've never said before on a radio show. I've been doing radio for 30 years or more and on radio shows. And that is that what I've learned in the last maybe 10 years is you can dramatically improve your level of animation. You can dramatically improve uh, the way that you really come across to an audience uh, but you have to be willing to do it. And I've coached a few people. I've got a, a, a celebrity person I coach right now, and I've done you know uh, CEOs and stuff like that, and some you know pro football players and stuff over the years. People who want to speak for a living. Uh, speakers bureau sometimes will send me people who make this person better, you know. <laughs> um, and sometimes I'm like okay, and sometimes I'm like no, I can't do that. Right. Um, I, just, I just saw the video and I can't do it. <laughs> but, but but the truth is is that most people can get a lot better. So here's what I found. I, and I learned this. There was a guy as a CFO, and he was terrible. He was the kind of person who starts talking, and you just kind of lose the will to live. About five minutes in, like, oh, my God, I just – you start praying for your own death, and this guy <laughs> starts talking. It's just terrible. But what I found with him was he needed just to bump up the level of animation, needed to explain things, to improve clarity. So I, I, I think that uh, you can really do a lot. I mean, you can – however, whatever your level is, you can get a lot better. So that's true. And do you think that's primarily through practice or is it also, you know, you have to have the right resources, mentors? I mean, what do you recommend for folks 
maybe maybe it is speaking or maybe it's something else but they they have to hone their craft one of the things that's interesting you know there's an old saying that says that those who can't teach when it comes to speaking you might want to find somebody who really actually you know uh, if you're going to get a mentor someone who actually can really do it and has talent maybe earns a living doing it a lot of people who coach speaking aren't really speakers and I, I, I think that, that if you're working with, with a, a coach, having someone who actually does that, and there are a lot of people who speak and they have a certain level of talent, and that's what, you're, what you need to be around someone who can do that. The second thing is, is that uh, to, to be very realistic um, you know, and, and believe in the fact that you've got more gas in your speaker tank. A lot of people just have some belief, well, you know, I'm not very in- interesting or I'm not very that. A lot of that's just a belief system that you hold, and what you what you believe about yourself is what you project to an audience. You know, there, there's confidence and there's projected confidence. Some of the best people I've ever worked with in my entire life, who were the best from an audience, had zero confidence off stage. I mean, like zero. Mm. They were hard to be around. They were they were they had so such little confidence. But when they got in front of an audience, they took all that fear and projected it into energy. Wow. And they were they were just gangbusters. So I, I think that you probably have a lot more you know ability than you think you do. And no matter who you are, you can definitely get better. I, this CFO guy went from being horrible to good, and I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> Learn something really, new every day. I, yeah, I was surprised. You know, I even told you, you know, I'm surprised you're this good. No, no offense, but I'm surprised. Now, what do you say to a lot of people see folks such as yourself, or I interview a lot of successful people. They've reached certain pinnacles in their careers. And, you know, I want to get there, but it's just, it seems so far away. And I really liked how you kind of said, look, it took a while. I've been honing this for 20 years. So for people who, who kind of aim for something, but don't see the work or don't want to put it in or think they should come out of the gates like that. I mean, what was that learning curve like for you? Well, for me is I had to realize that though I had some experience in front of audiences, right? that uh, being a stand-up was not going to transfer directly into being a, a great speaker and that I had to make some decisions on, you know, on my own, in my own mind about the, rea- the reality of that. In other words, I, you know, being funny and, and having a proven track record of being funny and engaging an audience is one thing, but being able to have people see you as someone who can educate them and they can walk away with something that's tangible – they can really work with was different. So I definitely had to make that transition. Now, I had a lot of corporate experience. I also had some training experience. And so I had, I had a lot of pieces to the puzzle, um, but I had to actually put that together. So I had to actually create and hone an actual presentation. So I had to actually work on a real presentation. You know, I could work on my skills too, but I had to work on a presentation. And I, and, you know, and I had, to, I had to make some style adjustments. You know. As a stand-up, I kind of went through some phases. I think I started out as the guy who was too hip for the room, you know, the, mm-hmm. guy who was too, mm-hmm. <laughs> the guy who was very cool. And there was a certain level of arrogance to that. You know? mm-hmm. And then in, in, in the end, I think I was pretty much doing blue-collar comedy. So I kind of went through a whole phase you know, of that. Matter of fact, I was actually in the beginning of that. That's another long, long story. But, uh, um, yeah, so – I guess I, I, the, the, the big lesson here is I had a lot of the, the, the ingredients, but I had to put them together. And I had to practice. I had to get in front of, like I said, audiences that paid little money and sometimes little attention um, and just hone my craft. Right. And now a quick word from one of this week's sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by the Creative Pioneers over at Creative Live. Creative Live helps people unlock their creative potential. Their online creative catalog is a great place to rekindle your artistic spark or dig into new skills like photography, design, crafting, music production, and business savvy. You can watch classes in their massive online catalog, or come attend live and learn from the best. Experts like Tim Ferriss, Ann Geddes, and Alex Bloomberg will show you how to bring your A-game to whatever revs your engines. Go to creativelive.com slash smart people for 20% off any of Creative Live's classes. That's creativelive.com slash smart people for 20% off any of Creative Live's classes. Thrill yourself. Join a plucky community of creators today. And now back to the episode. And how do you feel about, you know, I don't want to call it failure per se, but the learning curve itself? Because I was just talking to, you know, my wife and I said, I feel like I've been on a learning curve for, you know, ever. A really steep one. You know, you take a new job. It's stressful. 
And then I just have this this mentality of as soon as I get good at it, let's move on to something else. And I, I live in this perpetual, I call it growth model, but it's also a doubt, you know, you doubt yourself because you're new at something. Right. So, and that happens all the time. And I find people, you know, I know myself, a lot of people are a little hard on themselves at first expecting greatness. So for someone like yourself, I mean, you've, you've comedy, that's one of the most brutal, you know, public speaking, that's brutal. Being in a position at a corporation where you're 27 and you're leading however many people all older than you. I mean, how do you deal with this? Uh Oh, I'm new to this and probably not that good. Well, well, something is pretty simple. If you keep switching what you're doing, you'll always be new. <laughs> right, right. That's the problem. Right. So, like, if you keep switching, then there's a lot of people who go, I just, I, 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 I'm always new. Well, that's because you are always changing what you do. Right. So sometimes you have to kind of go in a direction uh, and that's leading to something, and and not just keep changing and switching careers. I mean, I know people want to change and switch careers, but it, it, it is is the career you're on now actually leading to those skills, and is it connected to the next step? Mm-hmm. So you know, making a step from you know, uh, being uh, a worker to a leader to a manager is one thing. Uh, being from a, a leader, a manager in a company to an entrepreneur, those are all normal steps. But going from being a fireman to being a doctor is a weird <laughs> leap right. and seemingly insane. Uh, so I think that's part of the key. I don't think anybody wants to talk about that, but it's kind of sometimes where are you leaping from? And I know it's, you know, people get disappointed. Well, you know, because I am a fireman and I really, I really want to be a doctor. Well, that's great. But it's quite the leap. There might I'm, what's in between a fireman and a doctor? I have no idea. I don't know. You could be a, I don't know, a veterinarian that rescues dogs who are on fire. I, I have no <laughs> idea. But the what the interim is, you know, maybe there's a middle step. But the th- really thing I wanted to say when you said that was that there are many stories of people who you know came a long way. How did they get there? But the number one thing is is you have to actually work on being good. You have to be good. I talk to a lot of people who want to be speakers, and they, and they send me a bad video. A bad video of you being bad will not help you. <laughs> if you say, hey, look at me. I'm bad. Look, here's a video of me sucking for 30 minutes. Hmm. That's not going to help. I, people, I, I want to send this video to Speakers Bureau. Oh, if you never want to speak ever again and let the world know how terrible you are, you should send that video. Hmm. But you're, you, haven't got the, you don't have the skills to present yourself to the world. And it's called just getting good, getting in front of audiences and working and practicing, you know, whatever it is that you do. Um, if, if, if you're a salesperson, if you're out there selling, uh, you might not want to try to engage the top, top tier of your industry before you've gotten your presentation down. Mm. That's really interesting because the, the reason is I think sometimes perhaps careers such as sales don't seem to carry that that same mentality of, well, I have to get good before I aim to the top, right? If you take a, a brand new salesman and give them an opportunity, say, Hey, you want to go try and sell the CEO? They're going to be like, yeah, sure. I mean, I can sell the, you know, the lower level guy, but in industries such as comedy or speaking, it's kind of known, you know, if you've only ever spoken to 20 people and then somebody says, there's an opportunity to speak to 5,000, uh, you kind of hesitate for a minute and, and go, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Well, here's the truth about the, the ugly truth about being a speaker. If you, for some reason, had some amazing thing, you were, you were in a bank and the bank was robbed and you saved the bank from being robbed, you know, and you made it headlines and got some level of media, then maybe you have a speaking platform and maybe people want to hear you speak. And if you don't suck too bad, you maybe you can make it. I mean, that, that's really true. If you've got some level, you know, there's a guy that was uh, the, 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 who, who fought off the Somali pil- uh, pirates. I'm not sure he actually fought them off. I think he actually escaped in a boat. But whatever it was, <laughs> he seemed to run from them. But anyway, whatever it was that he did, that it was a lot, of, it's a, lot of, you know, it's a lot of media involved with that. So that's really true. So you can get famous first and then speak second. Hmm. But that is not what happens to most of us. You know, I was a road comic. I mean, I worked with all these famous people. I wasn't really famous, but even though I work with famous people, that, working with famous people does not make you famous, by the way. Um, so, you know, and I speak all over the country, and there are people out there who are not really relatively well-known, but they earn lots and lots of money. There are people who are very, very well-known who can't earn a lot of money because they don't have a skill. They've gotten out there with their name, and after a year and a half, they proved the world they weren't very good. Oh. So you have to be careful. I mean, if you do have a huge opportunity because you've got this big media thing, get some skills. 
I mean, you know, I, like I say, I work with people who are pro NFL players. I work with people who are, you know, known uh, CEOs and some celebrities because the fact is they go into the speaking business. They need to make sure they actually have the skills. So that's true. I don't have a lot of time to coach a lot of people, but I've done some of it. And I'm telling you, you know, you, you, you have to make sure that you are acquiring the skills you need for, for that next level. The other thing I'd like to say about all that is that, you know, uh, it, 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 it doesn't have to it, it doesn't have to be a struggle. It's just are you willing to actually put the time in? And we live in a world today where people, hey, I, I got on a singing contest, now I've got a record deal. Hey, I was on some show called America is not that talented, and then I, you know, won the show and now I'm in show business. Well, that's some of these people are terrible. I mean, I saw a kid, some eleven year old kids sing like crazy. And then five years later, he has he's got a couple of bad YouTube videos, but he didn't have the stage time. He didn't, you know, he he really wasn't very honed. He had one good performance on one show. That's not the same as having honed skills. So I think you got to pay your dues a little bit more than these days in society that we tell people they have to. That's a good point. Like like yeah. you said, honing your skills to have staying power takes the work to be the, exactly right. the overnight thing. You might, you know, you get your 15 minutes, but really in the end, where are you? And, and you know, that's highlighted by if I don't even know how long, but American Idol has been running for like 20 years. I think the vast majority of people could name maybe two of them, right. <laughs> you know, and they got national, I mean, recognition and d- right. deals and everything. So that's true. Yeah. And I think they should have a show called America is Marginally Talented. <laughs> That should be that should be the show. I don't know, man. If you watch The Voice, like they have some singers. That show, I don't know how they do it, but they got some people who can just straight sing. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. They've got a lot of people singing, and they show on TV the ones that were good. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Under, understand that. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they can videotape for nine weeks <laughs> and then show you five people. Oh, definitely. They okay, do a good so job at that. You can go to YouTube and see the ones that weren't so good. There are a lot of those too. So, yeah. Well, so let's talk about, you mentioned kind of the, the ugly truths of speaking. You know, yeah. when you first told me, oh, I think I did, I don't know, 90 events this year or whatever you said, I, I was a lot. Right. I, I didn't even do the math at the time. And then I was like, wait a second. Are you, are you ever home? Ever? <laughs> well, not much. Not much. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I had made a decision um, years ago. What do I want to do? And for me, I've always wanted to be in front of an audience. You know, that's what I liked about stand-up. I left stand-up because I didn't like the idea that every 20 seconds, you know, you get a house laugh. If you do, the club owner brings you back. If you don't, they don't. And that's all there is to stand-up. It, I didn't seem to affect people enough. And mm. I kept working with people who became famous, and then four years later, they weren't famous. Mm. Or I won't name any names, but I was working in this show one time in some, some city. We're doing like some, you know, punchline or something. This is years ago. And the person I was working with was the biggest star on TV in the 70s. And they were there at the comedy rendezvous with me. And I thought, the recycling of fame bothered me, you know. So I kind of decided I would, you know, I, did, I don't think I wanted to pursue stand-up. Like, I, I thought there's another way to do things. Mm. And so I left and did corporate stuff. And, and to be honest with you, it just made more money. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, I, I, I got to, I'm just not a starving artist. I don't want to be a starving artist. Sure. You know? It's not, I mean, there's uh, nothing against starving artists. I think if you want to be a starving artist, that's fine. You want to be near it with someone who's got some food and some money at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I want, I wanted to be an artist who didn't starve. So I kind of went in a direction. I thought I could help a lot of people, you know, right. Right. Um, and, and, and at the same time, I would be able to um, earn a living. And I don't know, I got to tell you, when I was doing stand up, you know, somebody might come up to me in, in a grocery store. Oh, hey, Garrison Wynn, I saw you. You opened for, you know, uh, Dennis Miller. And tw- 15 years ago, I remember you mm-hmm. in a grocery store. Mm-hmm. But no one came up to me and said, hey, you know, I saw you present, you know, last year. And, man, I wrote something down, which I carried up right on my wallet. And here it is. No one wow. ever said that. Yeah. Big well, difference. Big well, actually, difference. let's talk about that. So I've done my research. I've watched some videos. But instead of kind of taking guess or put words in, in your mouth – what is that message that if you, I mean, look, you do a lot of different speaking, a lot of different groups, you craft your message, all those things. But if you get the average, um, you know, either entrepreneur or just motivated person in a room who wants to make changes, who wants to progress, what do you tell them? I mean, you have, and we'll talk about this. You wrote a book, The Real Truth About Success. You've done it in the business world. You've done it in the speaking world. You have a vast amount of knowledge. So 
what is that key that you speak on that you really feel passionately about? Well, the number one thing that all humans value is feeling valuable. In our research, and uh, we work with Gallup and uh, Evolve Performance Group, and all their research showed that the people who feel valuable are more likely to be supportive even if they don't agree 100%. And it's called creating willingness. So people need to know their existing knowledge has value before they can be fully engaged. You know, so um, people who like what pe- – pe- people who – feel like you value them and know you are concerned about what is important to them will place a much higher value on you and what you have to offer. And that's not like a feel-good story or a theory. That is the overall accumulative results of Gallup opinion surveys for 70 years. So the only way to create value for yourself is to create it for others first. And, and as simple as that sounds, I mean, no matter what you're doing, the people that you are dealing with, you have to make them feel value before they value what you have to offer. And that's a, a, a gigantic message. There are people out there that do everything – beyond but that and they can't be successful because they don't understand what people are actually valuing so when they do all their wonderful great stuff it's off target there is all kinds of wonderful things you can do and say and create they're fantastic except the people that you're doing them for don't actually value them that's the problem you know what that reminds me of is uh, we we make reference to this sometimes but when you really break down you know you read the Steve Jobs biography and everything right. he talks about that you know you can you can build things that you think are great and people don't want and essentially they're useless but you can also right. build things and people might not even know they want them until they have them and they they value that and then look what that did for for apple essentially and let me tell you, let me tell you something that is a very very dangerous concept mm. and i'll tell you i'll tell you why so let's i'm going to be really honest there are a percentage of people and it's a very very small percentage of people that what they think and what they believe and what they think is the most important thing is something other people would believe that if they were enlightened to it. And uh, you can name those people on your ten fingers. Be very careful about we, – we, we tend to go down the paths of those who we can't follow very well. Ah. And it's a very dangerous. I mean, when I say dangerous, you can, people spend their whole lives chasing something that's that's it's terrible. The, the truth is, is jobs like you know a few people in our history, uh, not many. Uh, you know, Edison is one of them, uh, but there aren't many. Uh, you know that that really you know that really knew exactly what people respond to, and it's called guesswork. Hmm. So some of it could be luck, but a lot of it is just there's some people who have that kind of insight and intuition. Uh, Henry Ford in the beginning was that way. Henry Ford knew exact. Henry Ford knew without surveying any farmers that that a farmer would pay a lot of money or more money, you know, for a, for a vehicle than you think he would, and he would also adapt to it. Most people said, "No, nah, I mean, you, you farmers like horses, and they're gonna they're not going to want an automobile." But he believed with all his heart and was convinced they would, and he was right. That's a very powerful point, and I'm glad Absolutely. we got to this because you're right. I, you know, I think the soundbite that I mentioned is one that people know. You know, not everybody knows what they want to make it or sell it to them or whatever. Um, but personally, I haven't found that to be true in a lot of cases. I think there's 99% of people who create that and we never hear about them because they're broke. <laughs> right. And then we have the 1% who we all try to aspire to be. So I, I'm, I'm glad we covered that. You have to kind of know the market too. Like a lot of times we have these fault. We, we, we believe that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. He did not. He pretty much stole it. Mm. Uh, we, we think that, um, you know, we think that Thomas Edison invented lots of stuff. We think he invented a light bulb. He did not. Tesla worked for him and invented a light bulb while he worked for him. Matter of fact, the 1983 Chicago World's Fair that was lit up with light bulbs, they were all Tesla bulbs. Hmm. So, you know, uh, and and the difference was is that um, Gray didn't understand the application of the telephone, um, and neither and, and neither did uh, Edison, you know, I mean, sorry, Tesla didn't understand the true application of his stuff, too. So uh, great ideas are one thing. Understanding a great market is something else. Sometimes that's the same person, and it, it's... I, I, it's a hard thing to talk about because you don't want to discourage people. But 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 the, if you want to take a look at the best track record, it's the people who did research uh, on customer need and developed products that they guaranteed people actually wanted. The the most of people who've made a lot of money are those people. That's the mm. majority of people, not mm. the 
not the rare instance where, oh, I have an idea, I'm going to introduce it to the world. Sure. And remember, remember, even people like Zuckerberg, I mean, you know, there's a reason he had to pay the Winkle Boss twins $160 million bucks to get go because he didn't invent Facebook. So, yeah, important. that's actually, <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. We'll be right back to this interview after a quick word from our sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Igloo. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It's a cloud platform that can help you do your best work. Share files, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects. It's easy to use and easy to configure, even for the most non-technical of users. And it's built using responsive design, which means that everything that you can do at your desk, you can now do on the go, on your phone or tablet. The responsive design is meant to look great on all your devices. Whether you're a large enterprise stuck using SharePoint or a fast-growing business overwhelmed by apps, Create an intranet that matches your brand's look and feel, simplifies how you work, and is accessible on your phone. Sign up now and try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash smart people. That's igloosoftware.com slash smart people. When you sign up, invite up to 10 of your favorite coworkers to try it with you. And now back to the episode. Well, then let's talk about this idea of value. So you you go and you talk about it. And I think obviously, at least from what I know about speaking, you know, the idea is to really have one clear, one clear statement or thought that if people who listen to you take that away, that's the important part. Do you take it a step further? Do you talk about or provide resources or do you have any for us on how to take it to the next step? Okay, I get that we need to you know, to be valuable, we have to create value for others. Right. How do we do that? You know, in our, obviously in our given sphere. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm a a lot about research. A lot of people who speak, talk about a lot of things. There's some great speakers out there. Um, but what I do is I I look at what's actually happening and working, you know, in other words, I, I can tell you how to feel good about yourself and all that, but that's not really the direction I come from. I come from, okay, what do successful people, a lot of them actually specifically do? What did they do to actually become successful? And you take a look at, at the research, and you know. So, so, so an example. Let's take a look at uh, managers uh, and organizations that keep and attract top talent in a very successful organizations. What do they do? They actually create a very specific environment where people want to work. So, in other words, you know, they recognize their employees for their achievements. They make sure they have a clear picture of how what they do actually creates company success, and they give them clear goals uh, that are linked to better pay and opportunity. That's what a good job actually looks like. And people who, th- uh, who think they've got a good job do a good job. Hmm. And so the, the people who create that, they attract all the top talent, they keep all the great people, and they're more successful. So you know that, that's an example of, of, of what a human being or what a company can actually do that actually works. So uh, there are a lot of people who are super successful entrepreneurs. They hired people but were able to keep those top talented people and develop all kinds of great things because it was a great place to work. If people like working with you, then they'll be with you. If you want to partner with people, is it worth partnering with you? What's the advantage to working with you? Mm. And with these companies, these people, that's what it was. They, they made people feel valuable. Again, it came back to that for me. Yeah. Well, that's great. And it's kind of a, a, a natural segue to you. I wanted to talk a little bit about – um, your book, The Real Truth About Success. And, you know, I feel like I, I know that that was a while ago that you wrote that. Let's see. When, do you remember when that was? Uh, 2010. 2010. All right. So not, not too long ago. But um, there were some fascinating points that you made in there and some, some fascinating topics that you uncovered. And I think there's, there's some specific questions I have for you, given you're obviously blunt and upfront, which is necessary today, you know, right, to sort right. through a lot of the BS. You have the experience. You've seen some things that have happened. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is you discuss in the book, discovering your own personal advantage. Right. There's two things that I, I, I want to talk about with this, and, and unless you have others, but primarily it's how do you do that? How do you discover your own personal advantage? And also, once you know it, I feel like oftentimes people, since we are taught to fit in with society or to maybe sometimes downplay our strengths or, you know, there's a lot of lot of things going on. Once you know your personal advantage, what is the mindset we can use to best utilize it? Well, the the first thing is, is the people in your life that you've known, who've known you all your life that know you best. What do they say you do well? You have to start there. 
Stop thinking about what you think. Or the, the, what are the people around? You might have to ask them, hey, you know, you've known me all my life. What, do you th- what, what is the most common trait I have that you think is the most effective or valuable? You have to ask other people who've dealt with you for long periods of time. And that's a, a very important thing because sometimes you are totally blind to what it is. So number one, asking others what they think it is that you do well. Hmm. Uh, num- number two, I, I, I co-authored a book uh, that was the Amazon.com number one bestseller. Actually, came out in November called the Cowbell Principle. And in the Cowbell Principle, a cowbell was something that you know that you 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 love to do, and that actually there was a market for it. So if you love it and do it, it's based on the the uh, Will Ferrell sketch <laughs> on Saturday Night Live with you know. Uh, I was wondering if that's what it was based on. Yeah, I was yeah. like, wait a sec. Right. I well, he. <laughs> He's beating the cowbell loves it. Christopher Walken says he wants more cowbell, as weird as that is. Right. It's the band in between that he has to negotiate with. So if you love doing it, somebody wants it, you got to work out that middle part. And, and, and the thing is, and that's what the book is about, and the thing is, is that if you love doing it and somebody wants it, that's a cowbell. That is something that, you know, that you can, that, that, that's worth pursuing. So in the book, The Real Truth About Success, it talks about, okay, take, let's take a look at what your natural traits are. Like, what do you do naturally well? It doesn't take a lot of effort. People say you do it well. So let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do you, sure. Chris. So w- w- the, your life so far in the, you've been allowed, how old are you, 28? 32. 32. 32? Yep. You're, you're 32 years old. In your 32 years, what's the most common thing you've heard people say about you that's like a natural trait that they say you do well? Uh, you know, it's interesting. It, there is a commonality, and it, it tends to be, communicating and putting people at ease. So basically right. encouraging authentic communication. There you go. And I would say that's true. Uh, the time talking to you, I mean, I've spent talking to you uh, in, the, in the bar at Seattle. By the way, do you meet all of your people in a bar? <laughs> anyway, I wish. So, that means I spend I, a lot of time at bars. I meet all my <laughs> guests in bars. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, but, uh, but from talking to you there, I mean, immediately, immediately when I started talking to you, you were a very kind, open, nice person. It, it was really clear that you were genuine and nice and open. I immediately, it, no matter what you were talking about, I immediately felt that it was probably true hmm. and that you were probably passionate about what, what you did. I appreciate that. Yeah. In our interview so far today, anybody who's listening right now, here's a level of kindness and compassion and genuine curiousness mm-hmm. in your voice. Hmm. And when you're talking, you seem to be talking about, you know, you, you make it personal. You're asking questions like you're, you want to actually learn what someone is telling you. Correct. Yep. A lot of radio show uh, hosts ha- don't have that. People in podcasts don't really have that. So that's noticeable. Uh, so I would say, with the information we have now, that you have a trait of making people feel comfortably very quick. That's a gigantic advantage in life, that people can feel comfortable quickly. So what that means is, is that... That, you know, I'm um, sorry, I keep slapping my microphone. Uh, that's all um, right. And it's not because I have disdain for it. I can assure you it's, it's an accident. <laughs> um, but, but what happens is that when you meet someone and you encounter someone, like we talked about first impressions, that your first impression is extremely good. There's no – people trust you quickly. Mm-hmm. So you have the ability to build trust quickly. So that means anything that involved service, customer service, or sales – being a radio host, being a television show host, all those things. I mean, those are definite traits that were, are hugely important for that. Well, I'm, you know, first of all, thank you. Because what's interesting is, as you first mentioned, oftentimes we're blind to it. I right. have been blind to it until probably, I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you a defining moment. And for the listeners, I don't do this to, you know, we're not really here to talk about me, but I think everyone can internalize it and can start doing things. And I'm sure we'll talk about it, but like ask your friends. Right. So right. I, uh, I gave a speech at a wedding and, um, I'd done a few and a guy that I respect, but I don't know extremely well came up to me afterwards. And he said, if you can do that, you deserve to make a lot more money. Right. And it, that was extremely powerful. I didn't take it as I now am the next garrison win. Don't get me wrong. I took it as, you know what, maybe I do a good job of communicating, which for me, and the reason I'm going into this a little deeper is because I feel like oftentimes the things we're best at, we are most blind to because it's natural. Everything else we have to work at, but the thing we are best at is natural and we assume everyone else is the same way. That's right. 
I don't know. I just feel like it's powerful. It is very powerful. I mean, and let me tell you something. Let's just say, for example, that I had a, a group of people, I had 400 people, and we had to give them some terrible news. Terrible news. Mm-hmm. I think I'd pick you. <laughs> Oh God! I don't, because I don't want I, because that job. I know you don't want it. I'm just saying, but I think I can get you in front of 400 people and give them the worst news possible, and they could not have heard it from anyone they felt better about. They could not have heard it from any. It's going to sound great coming from you. That's funny. Because That's really funny. you have you have a detectable, seemingly measurable level of compassion, and it, it carries in your voice and the way you present yourself. So here's what that means. That means that um, if you were um, let's just say you have a job and you're giving a presentation to the CEO and you, and, you, and you had to tell the CEO, hey, you know what you guys have been working on for the last 10 years is not exactly the direction of the market. You know, mm-hmm. I, you, you should be the person saying that. Mm. Well, you know, I think the thing here is then first you were talking about figure that out. And the, and the, the biggest way is to blatantly ask people, essentially right. people that know you well. And probably not your parents because they'll tell you how great you are most likely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask, don't ask your parents much of anything. <laughs> so, you know, that's, don't, no offense, parents, but yeah. But then what I really like is how you said, okay, now how do we uh, utilize that in a, in a, in a manner that uh, provides us that unique advantage. And I know that's what you talk about in the right. real truth about success. And so you have this knack, obviously be given your business experience to say, you know what, here's a place where that fits. And, and so how can people, cause I'll tell you, I did career coaching for a little while and people right. now are suffering from this, this, there's too much to do, right? There's this overwhelm. There's too many options. So do you ever find or do you talk to people about kind of getting clear on how they utilize their talents, how they find their niche, how they grow in a space, things like that? Well, that's a very broad uh, yeah. concept area. But I, I will tell you that, you know, um, if, if you're going to, 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 to find what you do well, let me let's, let's give a little process. Number one, you have to ask people to close to you. That We talked about that. Let's ask people close to you, to you. But the other thing is, is you have to kind of be really honest with yourself. And it's not something people do well sometimes. And that is to get real about what you do well and what you don't do well and to think about what that is and to, to not buy into ideas or belief systems from your past that had to do with, you know, issues that happened to you or something someone told you a long time ago that was hurtful. A lot of times we hang on to that stuff, you know. Um, and, and in the book, The Real Truth About Success, there's a story um, of a guy who weighs 400 pounds and um, he's extremely successful. I mean, really successful. This is a true story about this. I know this guy. This guy's a, I know him personally. And I mean, very successful. Everybody knows who this guy is. You know, and I, I said, what's your secret? He goes, my secret is how big I am. He goes, no one ever forgets me. I wear brightly colored shirts. And I, they'll say, you know, you're the biggest guy to ever come in my office. When he goes to trade shows, they can see him from halfway across the floor. Everybody knows this guy. And he makes a lot of money and he is well thought of and all that. He has a brother who is exactly like him who believes it's his size that's stopping him from being successful. Wow. So a couple of things. Number one. The thing that you believe is your biggest problem and barrier may, in fact, often be the trait that will take you forward to success. And that's not always the easiest thing to grasp. I was told when I was like in the sixth grade that I talk way too much, that you talk so much, we, you won't shut up. You know what I mean? You were just your your you your mouth, you talking is going to ruin your life. Turns out not so much. Yeah. But that's what I was told by a very hippie sixth grade principal who told me if I would shut up, I could make it to the seventh grade, you know, basically. Um and that's what I was told. So yeah. Um I was also told that I was acting up in class and that being funny and making fun of the teacher and all the, all the things I did that was distracting the class I was distracting them with laughter which was going to make me a lifetime loser was what I was told by a teacher. Well, you know, that's because you grew up in the wrong era because I feel like now you know, there, there's there's this swing in the wrong direction where it's like a kid's, you know, jumping off a desk and and right. Parents are going, no, 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 he's just going to be a, a gymnast. You need to let right. him do that. You know, right. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. And then the truth is he needs to be heavily medicated. <laughs> the truth is. Exactly. Yeah, he needs to be. 
but yeah, but yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, when I was growing up, yeah, they, they kind of tended to, to, uh, to anything you did that wasn't, you know, what you thought you were supposed to do. They kind of shut that down. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I'm now I'm really excited because I didn't somehow, I, cause I think when we talked, I, I, you know, I, somehow I came across the real truth about success and I was like, this sounds great. You know, I looked at videos and everything, but I didn't see the cowbell principle and I just pulled it up real quick and I'm like, I can't wait to read this book. I mean, it's, it's, it's what we've been talking about. It sounds like it's a lot of the theories or not even theories, but what you came up with and the real truth about success, but it's on a, look, this is career advice. This is utilize your talents. This is put them into place. I, I don't know. I love it. Plus I love the Will Ferrell reference. Yeah, well, what happened is uh, myself and a social media guy that I work with, uh, Brian Carter, and and basically we were on working on one project, and we were we got sidetracked, and we looked at this other project, and we started working on it, and we said, okay, we got to get the book out fast. We got the book out very quickly. Uh, my my publisher is McGraw Hill. We did not go through McGraw Hill in this book, and we we put it out really quickly, um, and um, uh, ended up being uh, it. It was uh, Amazon.com number one bestseller, and if you can imagine, of all the books sold, but to, you know, like there's like of all the 10 million books that are in print, mm-hmm. you know, in any way, shape, or form, this thing hit 270. It was between the Bible and Harry Potter for about a week. Wow! So yeah, on Amazon, and we got we're very fortunate. So yeah, that, that's that's it's, it's a good book, but we got we got lucky on that one. <laughs> well, we'll yeah. link to that at SmartPeoplePodcast.com. Well, Garrison, again, I'm so glad we ran into each other, and it was great meeting you. Thank you again for for being on the show. Um, We've talked about the two books, The Real Truth About Success, and then The Cowbell Principle, which I'm now going to check out. Is there anywhere else that, you know, people can find you or look you up or, you know, if you want to just let our listeners know where you're at? Well, you know, you can uh, go to to, to go to GarrisonWynn.com. That's GarrisonWynn.com. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter uh, as well, and uh, so I'm, I'm out there. If you and if you Google my name I'm everywhere, yeah. you can find me on Wikipedia. You can find me. I'm just all over the place. I can attest yep. to that. Yep. <laughs> all right, Garrison. Well, again, thanks so much. And when this goes live, I'll be sure to shoot you an email, get you a link, and uh, we'll put it up there. Well, thank you so. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, it was you. a blast. Thank you. Yep. All right, Garrison. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Garrison Wynn. There is honestly nothing better than a chance meeting in an airport with just an awesome individual. Don't forget, you can find Garrison's books, The Real Truth About Success and The Cowbell Principle on Amazon or at your local bookstore. And if you do purchase through Amazon, please don't forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. When you go through the Smart People Podcast Amazon link, all purchases that you make will send us a nice little kickback from Amazon at no cost to you. So it is a super simple way to support the show. If you're looking for other ways to support the show, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and leave a rating, review, and comment over there. I hope everyone had an amazing Thanksgiving if you're in a country that celebrates Thanksgiving. And if not, I just hope you had an amazing week last week. Make sure you stay tuned to all things Smart People Podcast at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell anyone out on the street. We've got some great episodes coming up and our annual best of episodes will be coming out as well. So stay tuned for that and we will see you all next week. Today's episode was sponsored by the Slick Maestros over at Creative Live. Watch classes and learn from the best. Experts like Tim Ferriss, Ann Geddes, and Alex Bloomberg will show you how to bring your A-game to whatever revs your engines. Go to creativelive.com slash smart people for 20% off any of Creative Live's classes. Thrill yourself. Join an intrepid community of creators today. <laughs>